to the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. Try not to utilize the chat button as it doesn't do the same feature, so please utilize that Q&A. We will try our hardest to answer all the questions before 8 p.m. If for some reason we're unable to, we'll make sure that we connect with you to answer those questions at a later date. We also use the polls to evaluate the event, so you will have a couple pop-ups on your screen. We welcome you to um, evaluate our event on this poll. This is going to be recorded. I've just started recording it, so if you are wanting this after the event, just let us know or contact our office administrator and she is able to, to give you the event via Zoom. So before we get going, um, two things. First off, I wanted to point out that if the PowerPoint looks too large, so if the font is going off your screen, if you go to the top of your screen to view options, you can click to view. If you're having any issues viewing the, the PowerPoint, please try that. So I'm just going to do our first poll here, and this is just to get a, an understanding of who might be our audience today. So you'll see a pop-up on your screen there, and, and we'll give you about 30 seconds to fill that out. <clears throat> Perfect. So it looks like we have a, a good combination of people with us today from healthcare workers, some uh, parent and guardians of a great grieving child, some community members, and then some other as well. So thank you for doing that. Okay, so we will get going. Um, so we'll introduce your panel. We have three uh, amazing individuals here today. Uh, we have Danielle Marshall, who works at Hospice Simcoe, who's going to be presenting on anticipatory grief in children. We have Joan from Season Center, who will be presenting on the developmental stages in grief. And we have Victoria here, who will be presenting on a toolkit. <laughs> they will introduce themselves on their individual sections as well. So we'll get going with you, Danielle. Great, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. So I'm just gonna get started here. So yes, yeah, so I'm a community care coordinator at hospice. Um, so I share a role uh, doing community work as well as the children's uh, grief uh, work at hospice as well. Um, I do anticipatory, so supporting families in the community, um, at home, in the residence, and then as well, I also support families after a death has happened. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the program that we offer and what it looks like. So really the goal of the program is to provide one-on-one -on -one bereavement support and information with young individuals who are supporting or experiencing a loss and or anticipatory grief. The community care coordinator and the social worker will match volunteers with the child um, or the teen for bereavement support as well as anticipatory support. So it starts with a referral which is either a self-referral, uh, sometimes a family member reaching out, sometimes the referrals are coming from family connections, also known as children's aid. Sometimes we get referrals from family doctors um, and other community partners. That could be Lynn coordinators, um, teachers. We've really had referrals come from all over. We also get them from seasons from time to time. Um, from then, they would be contacted to do an intake with a social worker. Um, with really young kids, I usually start with an intake with just the parent or guardian, um, mostly just to get an idea of where the child's at and to um, really feel out the situation and um, help the parent with any uh, conversation, the parent or guardian with any conversation uh, pieces they're struggling with. Sometimes, especially with older kids over the age of 12, that intake is always done with the child. Step three is coordinating the plan of care with the caregivers and the teen or child. Really as young as three, we're asking kids, what do you want? What are you hoping for? Do you wanna talk about this? Is this something you want to do? So we create a plan um, and then we begin, we begin the matching process. So typically I would then match the child um, with a volunteer, one of our trained volunteers. Um, and then they together would have six to eight sessions uh, to, to talk about grief and to do some work together. Um, 
most of the time teens um, will have a one-to-one -one match, but then they are also in our group support. So our group support, we have one um, teen group, um, and that is for any teen who's had any sort of death loss that was significant to them. Okay. So the criteria for service, we said age four to 12. We will support children um, at age three, depending on their um, understanding. Um, typically, again, we would support the parent or the guardian if the child is under four, just given the fact that their um, developmental stages can be very different, their um, being able to verbalize their language, all of that is very different. Um, so I will absolutely do an intake with any age, uh, child's um, guardian or parent, um, but then we kind of, that's how we would match, usually four to 12. And then we, of course, have our 13 to 18, which would fall into our teen program. This person, uh, this child has had a significant person die in the last five years. They reside in Simcoe County. We have had people call us from Midland or um, Innisfil. As long as they're able to drive to us, um, that was kind of our pre-COVID rule. If you're okay to drive to us, we're happy to support you. Um, now we would just make that a conversation. So of course we would always make sure that individuals were connected with um, folks that are in their area that are close to them. So we support children who've lost an immediate family member, extended family members, others in their social circle. We've done bereavement uh, support with children who've lost a parent, a friend, family friend. We support children who are differently abled. Um, so there's no um, kind of criteria around the child that comes for support. It's very individual um, and we don't charge for our services. So just to kind of touch on what is anticipatory grief in children. So what am I even talking about? So anticipatory grief is the feeling of grief occurring before an impending loss. And those can also be um, secondary losses. So for example, the child is anticipating the loss, um, the death loss of a parent, but there's other losses that come with that. Perhaps they will have to move. Perhaps they will spend time in hospitals or other settings that are unfamiliar. They'll have new caregivers. There's lots of loss around that. Feelings may include, and I left it dot, 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 worry, confusion, fear, shock, anger, because those feelings may include anything, any feeling is completely and totally valid. Sometimes children actually experience relief. If that parent or loved one was actually abusive to them or was neglectful in any way, sometimes they're relieved to know they're going to die. We never, ever negate any um, feeling that a child may have. It's all valid. So... I kind of left that blank, feelings may include, but really you can insert any feeling into that. So the benefits of anticipatory grief, which is a little bit silly to say, um, but benefits, um, what I'm meaning by that is that sometimes children may have that unfinished business. I did pull this um, from also anticipatory. So parent, this can really be for anybody. Um, so resolving unfinished business, maybe this is um, time for a child to, um, let's say it's a 12 year old who has a disconnect with their father and this is a good time for them to reconnect that. Um, time spent together in meaningful ways, storytelling. This is a really great time to tell stories about your life. And then of course, a slow role transition. So children are seeing, you know, perhaps this was a parent, for example, or a caregiver, and they're slowly seeing this person not able to care for them. So they're, you know, that's the anticipation of the loss. Of course, there's complex emotions after a prolonged illness. Um, sometimes children, we hear this all the time. Is it bad that I'm glad my, my person died? Am I glad? Is it, and it's that wishing for death and that creates a really complicated emotion for, uh, for children and for adults. Um, the desire for their loved one um, to survive, but also be, being relieved that their suffering is going to end or has ended. Um, this creates really complex feelings for adults and for children of guilt, um, despite you know, this being a pretty normal reaction. And then of course, relief. So watching a loved one suffer can contribute to a sense of relief when the death eventually comes. Again, this is a natural reaction. So if we're starting uh, talking about death at an early um, 
an early stage, I always say start before they've had a death loss. So you see that dead bird on the sidewalk, you know, the, the goldfish is upside down in the tank. Those sorts of moments are fantastic times to just start the conversation. So here's some tips for sh starting the conversation and I call it teachable moments. Offering children the chance to talk about death, but never force it. Some children just don't feel comfortable talking about it. Perhaps they've had a negative experience. Perhaps it's just something that they're, they're worried about or they have some fears about. Pushing a conversation they don't want to have will lead to the opposite effect. This will shut the child down and create more distance between the adult who's trying to have the conversation. Create as an adult in the child's life, create opportunities where the conversation is just happening, happening naturally. So playing a board game, spending time in nature, baking, cooking together, going for a hike or a walk, all of those sorts of things are opportunities. Like I said, when you, you know, the kid steps on the ant hill or something and they see the ants have died, you can talk about that. Do you think that the ants can come back to life? No, they can't. They are dead. Their body has died. When there's a death in a book or movie, the family pet dies. These are, again, really great opportunities to talk about death and grief. I just put some of my personally favorite um, movies that have a death scene, but really any Disney movie, um, really any children's movie, somebody dies. I mean, every time I turn around, now that it's kind of in my brain and I talk about it, every single time I turn around in any sort of children's, even the newer ones, somebody dies. These are my favorite ones. I think that um, obviously a classic is Lion King, talking about death. And also, if you all uh, remember, if you've seen that movie, the main character thinks that it's his fault. So again, really great time to talk about death and loss. Um, the second movie there is Brother Bear personal favorite, seen it a hundred times, cry every single time still. Um, that movie is really great if you are a spiritual person. It has some um, indigenous roots, uh, so it's a little bit about reincarnation and becoming a spirit animal. Um, so again, if you want to talk a little bit about spirituality with your child, great movie. It's very, uh, it's a feel-good movie. Um, and then the last movie I have here is a picture um, from the movie Coco. That's a newer movie. Um, I think maybe it came out in 2018, uh, 2017, 2018. Again, a really great movie um, describing death. It's death is the main theme in the movie. Um, so it's the day of the dead in Mexico. Um, so that's a really good one. And it's not scary. I mean, I watched it. I watched it with children um, on and off. And it's, it's kind of lighthearted considering the whole movie is about the family being dead. So <laughs> it's pretty lighthearted <laughs> considering. Um, and again, a really great way to explain how different cultures deal with death, um, because this is um, this movie takes place in Mexico. All right. So prepare yourself first. So before you have this conversation, I always say this conversation is harder for the adult than it is for the child. Choosing an intimate time with your child. Um, so again, I'm I'm saying with your child, this is really if you're an adult caring for any child in any capacity. So choosing an intimate time really is, I say, driving in the car. Uh, you don't have to look at each other. Sometimes people find that really helpful. Kiddos in the back seat, you're in the front seat. Um, sometimes right before bed, you're reading a story. You guys are just having a little snuggle. Um, other times are just playing together quietly. Of course, when you're, you know, telling the kid to get off the playground because it's time to go home, not a good time to bring it up. Um, they're, you know, hyper excited, emotional, all those sorts of things. So you have to be selective. Um, as we all know, everyone's here probably because we work, will work or have worked with children. And so we know that the timing is key. Turn off your phone and any distractions. So if this conversation has to happen in a hospital room, maybe try putting a do not disturb sign on the outside of the door. Um, if you're at your home, you know, turn off the TV, uh, lock the door, <laughs> turn off your phone. Just try to really give your child uh, or the child you're supporting that um, undivided attention that they deserve for a really um, important conversation. Try to level with the child. So sit on the floor, beside them on the couch, whatever feels good for you and for that child, depending on the relationship you have. Prepare for a wide range of emotions for yourself and for the child. Um, children sometimes react by 
comforting the adults. That happens all the time. Parents are, or our caregivers are prepared for children to scream, crying, run out the room when really their reaction is, it's okay, mom, it's going to be okay. And, you know, they're comforting the, the parent or the guardian. Um, that happens sometimes, you know, when we have conversations at hospice, the social workers, the volunteers, and we're explaining these, these big things with kids. Oftentimes their reaction is, is silence. They don't have a lot to say, just give them some time. And then of course, prepare yourself for the reaction that could be anger, outward bursts of grief, um, emotion, those sorts of things, sorrow, crying. It's really hard to watch a kid cry like that. So just prepare yourself for that. Now, nine times out of 10, if you're an adult who's emotionally involved, you will have your own emotions talking about this subject totally okay. Just really important to assure the child that it's not them who made you sad. They didn't do anything wrong. You were already sad. Those emotions belong to you. Oftentimes children take on the emotion, they take on the sorrow, the pain, and they feel like because you're having the conversation with them and they started crying that now it's their fault that you're crying. So totally okay if you're going to get upset or if you're emotional, just be assure, just assure the child that it's um it's your own emotion. It's totally okay to cry. As adults in any capacity, we are modeling good grief for children. I've had volunteers in a volunteer role um, get upset while talking to children and start crying. Again, just assuring the child, wow, what you shared with me was really beautiful and that's why I'm crying. You didn't make me sad. So where to start when you're starting the conversation? So you've now prepared yourself, you've had preliminary conversations about um, the Lion King or Coco. Kids know what it means when the bird is dead on the sidewalk. You've prepared yourself mentally. Now where do you start? Start at the very beginning. Talk about the illness, talk about how it's changing the body of the person who has it. Use the words, name the illness. Do not say, you know, if you come into the situation and say, mommy's going to die, she's really sick, there's something wrong with her brain, she's going to go to sleep. That is setting a child up to be worried about sick brains and headaches and going to sleep. So just using the words, a child may never have heard the word brain tumor, but this is a good time to introduce a new word. When you name it, you can say, you don't have a brain tumor, perhaps you have a headache, but you don't have a brain tumor. So be sure to name the illness and name the symptoms. Be completely honest. When you're honest with children, this creates trusting future relationships. I will say that, again, nine times out of 10, when I meet with a kid and the parent or sibling or guardian or loved one has lied to them about something that's gone on, the child usually already knows the truth. They've overheard a conversation. They have um, researched it. Oh my gosh, kids have access to Google at like five years old and they know how to type. So they've looked it up. They know what's going to happen. If you're really honest with children using age appropriate language, this will create a future of really positive um, relationships and trusting relationships. Try to avoid using euphemisms such as grandpa is going to pass away. Dad is going to get sick and won't get better soon mom is going to go to sleep or go to heaven. I would say a lot of the times when I work with families and they say someone's going to go to heaven, kids think that's a place like Texas. They're going to visit, they're packing their bags. Maybe it's in the sky, I'm not really sure. So if you are somebody who comes from um, a religious um, family, a faith-based or other faith-based faith organization, feel free to talk about that. But if it's the first time you're mentioning heaven or another place, that can be a little bit confusing. Really clear, concrete language is the best way to explain that. I'm going to touch a little bit on the importance of legacy. A big piece of why, um, you know, anticipatory grief is there's a benefit. I kind of laughed when I said the benefits of it because one of the benefits is an opportunity to create meaningful legacy. So legacy activities are projects that may assist children and families in initiating the process of life review. So perhaps grandma is dying and kiddo is only nine or 10. They've only known grandma for you know, nine or 10 years, but grandma's been alive for 70. There's a lot of life review and a lot that kids would like to know about their loved one. 
This will result in a product that can be enjoyed by family and friends prior to and after the individual's death. Legacy work is not just about death and dying. It's about life and it's about living. It's about special connections and sharing previous moments with special people in your life. Living a legacy that gives your loved ones something to hold on to and provide comfort year after year. So I'm just sharing with you some legacy work that I've personally done with children. I've had permission to share these photos. So the first one, the hand molds on the left hand side of the screen um, actually was from a family um, where the child was um, terminal. So this was a legacy project that really was for the family. Uh, but this can be done um, and hospice does provide this uh, service if you're at the residence or in the community. and. Um, it's, it's more under our pediatric. So if um, a child's parent is dying, for example, we're happy to do these hand molds with the family. You just need to, to reach out to let us know the situation and we'll, we'll make that uh, work if we can. So the other one, uh, sometimes when people are really sick, uh, sometimes doing the, um, if they're quite symptomatic, they're not able to do the hand mold. Uh, the hand mold is specific timing, um, but the hand paint is good anytime. So as you can see in the other two photos here, um, the dad is actually the blue in the middle and the kids and the mom are all around um, with the other colors. So we were able to do a whole bunch of those uh, a couple weeks before dad died. This one's really special. Um, so this one is two kiddos that got to do some legacy work before their grandmother died. Um, so actually these little scarves that they're sewing here, these little pieces of fabric are from their grandmother's nightgown. And the really beautiful thing about this project was that they were able to work on it over at our um, hospice bell farm location and they got to show their grandma and she actually had been admitted to the residence and they were able to take it over and show her and she recognized that it was from her favorite uh, nightgown so it was a beautiful thing and now it's hanging up forever above their beds. So I'm going to end this portion of my presentation on this beautiful quote I love. The greatest gift that you can give your children is not protection from change, loss, pain, or stress, but the confidence and the tools to cope with all that life has to offer them. From Dr. Wendy Hart. Okay, passing it off to Joan. Thanks, Danielle. Um, <clears throat> so I might, you can go forward. One more. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I'm the uh, program director at Season Center for Grieving Children. Um, we are celebrating our 25th anniversary this year. Um, <clears throat> and so at Season Center, uh, our mission is Grief Matters. Our Season Center provides peer support and education for children, youth and families facing the death of a loved one. Our vision is that we build resilience in children, strengthens families, and empowers the community to grow from grief. And the main thing that Season Center does is peer support groups for children who have had either a parent or a sibling who has died. Um, we have different kinds of groups. We have Sons and Daughters, which is for children who have uh, a parent die from illness or accident. We have a siblings group. <clears throat> we have child survivors of suicide. And we also have um, an OD group, which is a, a new one last year, which is for overdose uh, groups. And uh, we also have teen groups, young adult groups, and we also have uh, caregiver groups um, and parent groups, either empty arms, which is for parents who have had a child under the age of 24 who's died and another one called On Our Own, which is for parents um, whose spouse or life partner has died and they're raising children under 18 years of age. Um, so why a place like Season Center? So really it's, on, it's about supporting children so they don't have unresolved grief because that can certainly lead to uh, various mental health issues, such as major depression, 
Um, it can also lead to um, addictions, uh, an alcohol or drug abuse, um, relationship difficulties, not just with a, a spouse, but relationships with anybody, whether it's friends, uh, co-workers, and that. Uh, it can also lead to child abuse and uh, also uh, suicidal thoughts. So part of, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, for brain development, so neuro neuroscientists now believe our brains continue to develop until our mid-20s, something like 2024. The front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, doesn't have nearly the functional capacity at age 18 as it does at 25 now. So what factors affect a child's grief process? Um, it's either their experience um, with a previous loss. Um, you know, we have children who come into the center at uh, nine years old and they've experienced, I remember one child experienced the death of a, um, a father, a brother, <clears throat> and then their mother. And it was like they were nine years old. So they really had um, um, some tragic events go on in their life. Um, and then you can have children who also <clears throat> who come in at 12 years old and, and have experienced their first death. Um, so everybody's quite different. Um, another factor is the uh, specific nature of the death. So how did the, how did the person die can affect how a child grieves. Um, trauma uh, definitely can affect a child's grief process their mental and physical health. So the mental and physical health of the child, and I think Danielle had, <clears throat> had also mentioned earlier uh, um, about differently abled uh, children. And so that certainly depends on um, how, they, how they think uh, about how they can grieve. Uh, their spiritual beliefs, um, their intellect can also affect um, their process. Um, their support structure um, certainly will affect how a child grieves. If they have a lot of support in their, their family, uh, in their life, uh, that's a good thing. If they don't have as much support, um, <clears throat> that can lead to um, a more complicated grief process. Also the relationship with the deceased and who died. And um, I, I think again, Danielle had mentioned this earlier as well, that if you have children who have had a parent die, but that relationship with that parent was not um, stable or the parent was abusive, uh, a lot of people may think they may be sad that the, that parent has died where in reality, the child um, may not be sad at all and may feel relief in the fact that um, they are no longer in the role of being abused. <clears throat> Their age, and I'm gonna go into that a little bit later, and culture and the health of the family system prior to the death will also affect how a child grieves. So, Understanding children's grief. Children are continually physical, emotional, cognitive, and spiritual development. Um, depending on their age and stage, they have different skills and care needs. And children communicate differently than adults. And a lot of that um, comes through their behavior. Um, and as Danielle had also mentioned earlier, too, it's about talking with them, but sometimes children. Um, <clears throat> have a difficult time expressing themselves in words, but their behavior can show what is um, bothering them. Children can be concrete in their thinking as they grow older, uh, becomes more abstract. So for some children, if grandma goes to the hospital and dies, everybody who goes to the hospital dies. Um, they generalize from the specific to the general. They're also repetitive in their grief and they can have what we call grief outbursts. Um, and part of that is their search for meaning for what a death is. 
Uh, they're also physical in their grief and they grieve. Um, sometimes we can learn from children because they can grieve and then they can go and play with their friends mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, you know, they may have a grief outburst or um, a grief uh, feeling. And that's really um, um, how we can learn from kids in some way. If we could just let that go and give our bodies and our minds some relief. But um, it seems as we get older, that's harder to do. Yeah. Next one. So um, phases of cognitive development for birth to, uh, to two years. Um, it's really sensor, a sensory motor and they explore the world <clears throat> through, you know, touching, um, putting things in their mouth, um, uh, looking uh, at, at people. The younger they are, they lack object permanence, which is when you play the game of peekaboo, you know, and they don't understand that your face is behind the hands as you're playing. Um, and it's not until around eight months or so that a child will start looking for a favorite object, such as a, a favorite toy. And um, between birth and two, they can also uh, develop stranger anxiety as well. Um, so their psychosocial development. Um, so a baby may miss an ache for the touch, sound, sight, and smell of the primary caregiver. Um, their responses can be crying, sucking, sleeplessness, irritable. Uh, a few years ago, there was a, a, a commercial on TV uh, put out by MAD where it shows a picture of a baby in a crib um, crying. And uh, the, um, that is a good response to um, showing you know, the parents not coming home and they're crying and whatever. The support is physical contact, uh, normal routines uh, as, as much as possible. Um, usually between, they don't understand what death is by that time. They just understand that the person's not there anymore. So for ages two to five, it signifies items with words and images so they can look and see who mom is, who dad is, um, you know, who the dog is. Um, language is better understood than expressed um, as well. Um, they lack logical reasoning um, and they're also egocentric. So a lot of, a lot of stuff is about them. Um, it's all about them, okay. So uh, for that age with developmental levels and grief, um, they understand the child, or the, sorry, they understand that the person is gone and they may begin to grasp the finality of death. That can also be because of um, if they've um, experienced death before, whether it's a, a pet or a grandparent or, um, reading a book about death to them before. Um, but they will re repeatedly ask the same questions. They may have temper tantrums and they also may regress. Um, and the support for them would be frequent uh, repetition, hugs, uh, consistent routine, being honest, always being honest, and helping them by labeling their emotions, like, are you feeling sad? Are you feeling angry or mad? That kind of thing. Okay, I know. Uh, between five and 10, they're more concrete and operational. They explore the world outside of themselves. They gain more cognitive ability to understand uh, that change in shape does not mean a change in quantity. Um, Fantasy, they have the fantasy thinking and the wishing, and they start to think logical about concrete events as well. The other one, so the, uh, the developmental levels and grief for this age is a clear understanding of death, and they also understand it's not uh, irreversible. Um, their response is usually an increase in physical energy, behavior changes, and sleep disturbances. 
um, symbolic play using art, stories, appropriate outlets for energy, honesty and peer support is um, a good thing for them. Children, uh, what my experience is with some children, um, they feel like they're the only one who has had a parent die or a sibling die. And so when they're in a group with other children, uh, then they know they're not, um, they know they're not the only ones and they can uh, relate uh, well with other kids. They like to. Um, okay. So the three tasks of grieving for children is to understand that the person has died. Now they sometimes may ask odd questions, but they're curious regarding what happened. And so they, are, they will have different questions. And the word dead is used long before they really understand what it means. Um, and there's also a lag time between hearing the word dead and feeling the emotions. Mm -hmm. um, kids, may, you may uh, sit and chat with them about, uh, you know, mom has died and they, they hear you and they say, okay, can I go out to play? And that is, they're still taking it in. They still don't quite get it. Uh, and then uh, somewhere along the line, that it will hit them and the emotions will come forward. So what helps? So be aware of their developmental level. Um, certainly include in the dying process, as, as Danielle had spoken about earlier. Um, also include in the funeral and memorial services if you can. I've actually um, at the center I've heard some, I'm going to say horror stories of children who were not allowed to um, partake in the funeral or make decisions in the funeral. I remember one young girl who wanted to sing uh, a song at her mother's funeral and um, she was not allowed to. And that really had an impact uh, on her. And uh, eventually uh, in the group, we then uh, set it up for her to be able to sing the song that, that she wanted to, which did help her feel a little bit better, but it, it still wasn't at the funeral. Um, and always telling the truth. <laughs> and you can't stress that enough, I guess, as Danielle had mentioned earlier as well. Um, you can't be, uh, if you don't tell the truth, you can't work with it. Um, and um, so, it, you know, for us, if somebody says, uh, you know, that their parent died by suicide or their spouse died by suicide, but they're not telling the children, um, at the center, they, uh, we, they can't come to the center till the children knows the truth. It's not, um, I think it's more difficult for the parent or the caregiver or the adult to accept that than it is for children uh, to accept that and or totally understand it. As they get older, they'll, they'll understand more. But because you've used the word, then they will be open and be able to ask you more questions. Um, about what is that. The tech, second task is to feel the feelings about the person who has died. For a lot of children and for some adults, grief is physical. Um, the child's behavior is their language of the grief. Um, defenses such as acting out or becoming withdrawn or over achievement and you know, sometimes children who may may have been C plus students um, and didn't really um, spend a lot of time doing schoolwork may all of a sudden change and everybody thinks that's great. You know, they're getting A's now, they do nothing but schoolwork. And, but you really need to look at that because they may be using that as, as a defense and not feeling the feelings. They may feel responsible for the death um, as well. And again, you need to be able to chat with them um, about that. And I had spoken about grief bursts earlier. Okay. 
So what helps is listening, accepting, and caring, provides safe physical expression. And that can be um, anything from, um, you know, doing jumping jacks, going out and playing some sport on the, uh, on the street, um, or, um, you know, I, when my son was younger, I used to get him to uh, run in the backyard. He had so much energy and he would run up and down from the house to the back and, and forward again. And uh, then he learned to do that on his own. And the, it was great for him. The unfortunate thing was I left a, a, a line of dirt in the backyard because he had worn the grass down so much. <laughs> So there's lots of different ways you can get your kids to be active. So what helps is listening, accepting, and, and caring. Oh, sorry. Um, I thought you changed it. <laughs> and therapy for complicated grief. Sometimes um, group, uh, for us, we realize that we only do groups at Season Center, and we realize that sometimes group may not be the most appropriate um, therapy or uh, outlet for children and we do refer them on to hospice simco for the individual um, that they may need and the third task for children is to go on living and loving after the person has died um, so you go from why did it happen to what do i do now it's trying to find what that new normal is in everyone's life um they also still need to take time out for grief because grief never goes away it just changes time does lessen the intensity of it but it's always there so what helps time being aware of our own grief um you can't fix it a lot of times uh when we go uh, in or um, to support children, whether you're a staff, whether you're a volunteer or whatever, we want to fix it. We want to make them feel better. And wouldn't that be wonderful if that's something we could do, but you, you can't do that. So um, you need to uh, also be aware of your own grief and, uh, and is your grief being triggered by working with this child? or whatever so you have to make sure you know the difference whether it's your grief or the child's grief okay and always believing in return to wellness and guess what <laughs> i have the same one as you do danielle and i love this saying about the the greatest gift you can give your children is not the protection from change loss pain or stress but confidence and tools to cope and grow with all that life has to offer them. I just love that saying. Yeah. That's it. It's a picture of our circle room that's at the center. Yeah. Thanks. Victoria. Great. Thank you so much. I love how what both of you are saying, like it's just so complimentary. So that's <laughs> fantastic. I love listening to it. And I am extremely honored to be here today with everybody and thank you for joining us and taking your time out and just knowing that this is going to be taped is also awesome for anybody that you think you could recommend it to later. That's fantastic. And then I wanted to thank also because there's people in the background that made this happen. <laughs> Thanks to Tanil and uh, Sam and Doris because uh, actually Tanil tried to arrange us probably three times this year and because of COVID here we are finally today and it's fantastic that we're sitting here so thank you to the people that you can't see on the screen because none of this ever happens without them and I am just so grateful to be here with you. I'm here as a volunteer and I've been volunteering at hospice for two years and had the pleasure of working with Tanil and Danielle very closely and um, it was just a place I felt like I was called to be and to offer all my experiences. I come from a place myself <clears throat> as um, an educator. So my love of education, my love of children, I've worked with young children and in university level and my research in the last seven years worked more in the area of um, 
therapy and counseling with um, teens and adults. So all of these parts of me, I get to come to hospice and share them lovingly and freely. And I am extremely grateful to share some of these tools with you that we use at hospice today. So um, these are just a few because we have many resources at hospice and also you have many things in your own home that you can use if that's the situation that you're working from. So just looking at, these are just a few suggestions that through uh, gentle and non-threatening conversations, as has been mentioned, that you can have with children to help them to express themselves. That's the best thing we can do, like whether it's physically or written or in art or music, there's just a lot of tools and you have lots of these things in your own homes or in the environment that you work in. We are always trying to promote connection with the child, first of all, when we're working with them, and also with the family unit. And that has been such a huge gift at hospice. And I've also been at Season Center. So it's always that we're always trying to come from a place of connection, which is everybody's deepest desire in life is to feel connected to other people. Um, so with the children, they are gonna get the one-on-one -on -one attention that they absolutely need and in a safe place where they can express their emotions or ask questions and just basically learn about life and death at the same time and the pain and the joy of it all. It's, um, we're always all going through this. And the, um, the toolkit, the just providing support by normalizing all their feelings and thoughts and expressions uh, some children don't have a huge repertoire of emotions. So this is a huge exploration for young children, whether they're at hospice or at home. Um, some children only know three or four or five emotions. They don't know what this feeling of confusion is. And we get to be part of their healing process and teach them that any feeling you have is totally okay. We don't have to be afraid of those feelings and we give them some tools to help them express their emotional literacy, naming their feelings, giving them ways to self-soothe and ways that they can cope with these strange feelings that they have that are they feel like they're taking over their bodies or something. And that's when you see some of the, the behaviors that Joan was talking about. It's like, they don't really know what's happening. So, um, and sometimes they just have to keep revisiting an emotion until it makes sense to them. I mean, I have literally worked with children who have repeated the same play pattern for five weeks in a row. And you must be with them. If they want to play with the doctor kit for five weeks in a row and never leave that because something traumatic happened, that's okay. Don't, try and take them away from that. They are trying to work through their own way of coming to an understanding of what happened in their life. And it's critical for us just to um, try and be at peace with that and not try and move them out of what they're trying to work through in their little bodies. Um, yeah, even as adults, we, you know, we're all spiraling up and down through our own life stories of abandonment or whatever it was. It's children are going through the same exercises and trying to heal. Uh, so this, the toolkits or things that you have help facilitate emotional expression, as mentioned, arts, crafts, physical activities, games. And I mean, we have a lot, but season center. <laughs> So it's a pretty amazing place there too. Uh, so we get let them get involved in meaningful ways and also just very carefully respecting the child's choices. Um, you know, some of the age appropriate things that Joan mentioned, their feelings and emotions and growth patterns. You, I've worked with three-year-olds. They, they may not be interested in writing at all, but they are sure going to be interested when I dump out a bunch of buttons on the table and their face just lights up with joy. And, yeah. you know, a simple thing like talking about the colors of buttons becomes a beautiful conversation to what makes you feel happy, the red button or the yellow button and all these kinds of beautiful emotions come out through the expression of color and paint and puppets. Oh my gosh. You just see whole new worlds and um, 
you realize the world of imagination for a three-year-old is a far better place to express grief and sadness when they're talking to a puppet rather than they're talking to some lady that they don't really know that well, but it works. It's, um, it's very magical and very healing experience to be around. So, and it also gives, you know, supporting them as they find ways to connect with the person who's died. You know, Danielle showed the, um, the legacy project of the fabric, but also, you know, it could be um, other things. Just take clues from them. They'll tell you what their, what were their grandma's favorite things or that their, uh, their grandpa loved cars. Next thing you know, you're playing with some cars. Take their, your cues from kids. Mm -hmm. uh, they know what's meaningful to them. And it's hard as adults to sometimes just to really sit back and watch. You don't really have to do a lot of talking sometimes. It's better to be quiet most often and just let them lead the way. It's, um, I was with a little person last week actually, and uh, we went out into the garden because that's what she wanted to do. And the next thing we knew, we were talking to snapdragons and it was pretty, you know, snapdragons, you can open their mouth. Well, I was talking as the person you know, who had died as a snapdragon. And there I was, and she was like, oh, she thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, got a talking snapdragon that sounds like my parent. It can be a lot of fun, you know, there can be joy in this too. So the, uh, the toolkit, as I said, the um, use what you have in your house or whatever is around you. These are just ideas. And, you know, we, we have resources at the Season Center and at hospice that, you know, are, that work and we've purchased. But, you know, you, you likely, as Danielle mentioned, for videos or you have books in your house for educational purposes. Um, and if you don't, come and borrow them from us. You know, we, we, you have that option. And um, emotions cards. We have things that are just amazing. You'll see one in a minute. But... Um, you don't have to use that. You can use popsicle sticks and write down emotions on popsicle mm. sticks and it becomes a game with children. Uh, and painting, any kind of paint you've got in the house, you just need one brush and a few colors and you just need four. <laughs> you can make them all with four colors. And you know, you go in your cupboards and painting, any kind of paint, crafts. It doesn't take much, a cardboard box and some scissors and some tape. You can make some pretty amazing things in your house. You, we've all been there if you have children. You can have a million toys in a room and what do they go to first, the cardboard box? box. <laughs> it doesn't, or the popsicle sticks, you know, it could yeah. be a couple dollars and that's all it takes. Um, little bit of tape, little bit of glue, little bit of popsicle sticks, buttons. I mean, I have a jar of buttons. It's like, who would think that a jar of buttons is like the best toy ever? It turns out be, oftentimes children are happier than anything with a piece of string and 15 buttons. And the next thing you know, you've got bracelets and necklaces and everything going and they're quite delighted and engaged. And when you're talking about parallel play with kids, working with kids, that's when you can have some fantastic conversations with them about death as well. Um, pencils, markers, anything that you've got in your house. And that other category that you see there is um, the one where, I know that when I work with kids or when I'm talking about death or grief or you know anticipatory grief, just I know that I'm gonna be with them for an hour. So I do have a little ritual that I do, but it's not impossible to do that at home either. It's just like setting the tone, as Danielle mentioned, for having that conversation with kids. I have a meditation bell and I always start the talk with our little session with that. Even if they're three, you, you could be surprised at how happy a child is walking around a room with a drum at the beginning, at the end of spending time together. And it is, they know that, okay, we're either going to talk about grandma or grandpa. And then as we're walking, they're beating the drum, calling their name. It's so simple and that's all it takes. But they get ready for that. Their little body gets ready and it puts them in a space of this is sacred time and sacred space for me 
and Victoria or whoever it is to talk about grandma or grandpa. And they, you would be amazed at how well they respond to that. And as a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a grandma or grandpa, if you set the tone for that, then their mind and their body and their heart get ready to, to be touched and to share those emotions. And it's, it's quite beautiful for them. And that helps them, that helps them acquire the language and the emotions and be open to that kind of learning conversation that you're engaging them in. Yeah, so the, the toolkit, it helps them realize um, in this that they are not alone um, and that death is real. And, you know, telling the story as both Danielle and Joan have mentioned that it is, you know, it's telling, talking truth and saying the real words is important. Um, they get to tell their stories. Um, they use journals and they are exploring their emotions, uh, exploring their memories that they had. And even if, you know, it's before the special person passes away or dies, then it's okay. They're just exploring those memories that they had through their life. And possibly that's a story that they're gonna go and talk to their grandma or grandpa or mom or dad about before they actually die. And they're grateful for it. And you, you can help them do that by writing a letter or creating a memento. And it creates very special moments for them because they got to lay in bed with grandma and share how much they loved her in the bed at hospice. And how special is that? You know, I actually, I had that experience when I was a kid. So to be able to give that again to other little people at hospice now, it's like the best gift, gift ever. They, they know what the pain is, they know what the sorrow is, but they also know the joy of laying there and loving their grandma or their grandpa. So it's pretty awesome to have those beautiful memories as well. Mm -hmm. And it gives them a chance to release and realize what exactly has happened. And our my role and everybody else's at hospice and you at home too is to encourage opening up to those feelings and emotions and communication, whatever form it comes in, whether it's language or not, it, um, we can all be a part of that and help children grow. Uh, the, the toolkit I mentioned about the, um, the ritual of focusing and grounding. And like, you know, as I mentioned, it just helps them move from what they were doing in the day to now we're gonna create a very special space for you and a place for you to talk about things uh, that are special. I mean, we, at hospice, I would use those little battery operated candles, which is pretty sweet for kids. And the other thing is just even um, a bedtime ritual or the an altar ritual. This just can be a table where a piece of cloth has set up with photographs of their special person and um, they might be doing something like sending a love letter to their grandma or their grandpa or their mom or their dad. And, and kids have done this. We've helped them write the letter at hospice. They take it home. And we have had people set this up and it's been in their house for weeks. And they're questioning maybe, do I take this down? Well, when you're ready and when the child's ready. But until that point, it's like having a special altar and a ritual for sending out love and still being able to talk to them. They're not there pres in physical presence, but they are still there with them. Yeah. So the what I mentioned earlier was about the emotions cards. And I'm telling you, I'm in love with these cards. So <laughs> I, even adults love them. I think that we, we've used them with teens in our Care for Caregivers group. But um, I can't think of the name of the box right now, but Danielle might remember. But we can put it in our resources at the end sometime. But um, I mean, look at that scallion. Is this scallion nervous or amused? So we would show the children the scallion and then, um, and then they, we ask them the questions. And you know, the, the box probably has like 35 cards in it, but at the beginning of having a little visit about talking about their person, uh, their loved person, um, we might do five and just check in with them. Um, and then, and the Kiwi, is it ready to go to work or is it ready to go to sleep? <laughs> totally just a way to get them in touch with what does numb look like? What does sleepy look like? What does grumpy, happy, sad look like? And 
I am amazed with a little bit of work how young children, I mean, we've seen them come in with a repertoire through the picture alone of more than 10 emotions and some with none, like very few. So it's just a really good tool to um, even just using blank circles and drawing expressions mm -hmm. in them. And there are many of those around on the internet to uh, print out if you want. But um, yeah, don't even know the expressions of guilt sometimes but, or shame and, and we can help them for sure. The other one is, um, tool is a, a easy one too, because the physical body, as Joan pointed out for kids, is a very source of, good source of emotions and they don't know what it is. They might have a lump in their throat. They might have a knot in their tummy, but what's the weather like in there? Is it sunny inside your body? Is it relaxed inside your body? Do you have clouds? Do you have clouds in your body? And just the explanation, the tool of, like, just like outside, we can't change the weather. It's kind of like that in our body, but we can teach them some tools about how to calm their body down by doing a little meditation. Um, and even a simple one is a figure eight where they're breathing up and then breathing down. Simple tool, but with children, it's, it, it's magic. They learn, they can learn to control their breath with a simple tool by just running their figure, hand, their finger along the figure eight and learning a simple tool of how to do that. Or on another day, they might feel like crying and you can see it in their eyes by just acknowledging, oh, it looks like you feel like crying. What sounds like you've got some teary weather in there. And when you give them permission, away they go. You're likely going to cry too, but, and I do, and that's okay. <laughs> you just be open and honest about it, right? It just happens. There's no need to make it go away. That's part of, part of the joy of connecting with people when you're going through this journey. This is one of my favorite books. The idea that, you know, we understand that even though we may be separated from those that we love, we are always connected. And um, this book is probably one of the best sellers in uh, dealing with grief. I, don't, I think they only mentioned death in the book once, but it's uh, just the idea that it can comfort and it helps with loss and separation. And, you know, possible activities are, like I mentioned, with necklaces and bracelets. I've had children go home with like three necklaces to give to people that they'd like to be connected with for the rest of their life. Because now they've got this invisible string, but they want something tangible as, as well to um, realize. And then drawings of who they're connected with. And they're up in the clouds. And the artwork that comes out of it is amazing. And the next um, slide is of a... This is amazing little person. If if you're out there somewhere, you know this is you, <laughs> and mom's with you. But um, this was a beautiful necklace that he, this a little boy, created, and it just is it speaks so loudly to the ongoing connection with the person who is dying or who has died. And I'm just going to read his quote because it's so beautiful. These were all the little items that he put on this necklace. The bell is to ring when I'm sad sometimes. And the gold bead is when I am happy. I will open it when I am happy. When I am sad, I will close it totally. It feels cool. The blue is on Grammy's ring. One side is my world and one side is Grammy's. When I put my finger inside, we can join into her world. This is so I can, the shell is so I can hear the ocean and get calm. And the black and white bead is so I can touch it when I'm scared and remember that there are fun times. So the black and the white, like children are amazing. So I think in this whole experience, I think we went through joy and sadness. And again, when I dump buttons and things on the table, just children just, you can see the delight in their faces. And then, but also the little memories that get attached on one simple little necklace. You know, just so beautiful. And the next slide is um, is a fun activity. I think I saw Danielle do this one the first time, and then I used it every time after that. But it's just so sweet and magical too. Just the idea that it's another form of release 
for children to know that their loved ones are always a part of us. So you're basically taking two pieces of Play-Doh, say we've got the blue one and the yellow one. And with the blue one, they're making something that represents their mom. And so it's a heart maybe. And now you've got this beautiful heart. And the yellow one is their toy truck that they love playing with. And they've formed it and they've talked about both. Now you're telling them to smush them all together. And it's like really hard. They're really smushed. And then it's like, now pull them apart. It's impossible. They, they sit there and I think, what kind of crazy lady asks me to pull this all apart? No, it's actually impossible. And they sit there and they're trying to figure it out and trying to figure it out. And then you finally say, well, that's kind of like how connected you will always be to your your grandma or your grandpa or your loved one. And like the expressions on their face is like, Oh, that's for real. That that's, that's true. I'm all, I am going to be always connected to her. So loved ones are a part of us forever. So that's the idea of play therapy. So anything I've mentioned, a lot of what we do at hospice at, and at season center is play therapy with puppets, worry dolls, masks, dress up, doctor kits, dancing, allowing them to express themselves in any way they can. And, and the picture you see there is a very simple one, even of a paper plate, two paper plates glued together, even with happy and sad, if you're dealing with two emotions, ask 10 questions and you'll get 10 answers. Yes, or, or happy or sad, a good way to start. And then they, they might create stories that ha help them act out their grief. And again, just always watching to see what they're interested in. This one, journaling, some kids really fly with it. Um, again, just helps them, whether it's in pictures, as you can see there, and they may not see the purpose right away, but sharing it can be rewarding. I always scribe for little kids because I see the value in the sense that it is a legacy for them to have later. This little three-year-old may not be able to write, and I see myself as a scribe for that child um, down the road, whether it was their mom or their dad or the grandma. They, they won't remember what they said when they were three, but if they go back later, you have this beautiful story of exactly what they drew and exactly what they said. And uh, it's a beautiful gift to give them because you know it's gonna get tucked somewhere in their house so that they can remember it later. And especially for some of these kids that we work with that are three and that have lost a parent. I think it's just a, a really important tool for somebody to tuck away for them to have later when they're trying to figure out who they are in life. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, see, these can be some simple questions that can be asked for a journal. How do you feel when you're with your friends? How do you feel when you have candy? How do you feel when you think about the person who died? So getting at simple questions, but they can be journal prompts. Um, you might not get any answers. You might just be writing down simple words, but that's fine. I just put them down and date them so that they have this special tool for later and they may realize later that they responded this way five days after their mom or sister died. And it, it is a, a memory about when the death occurred and how they were feeling at the time, who came, who visited. I don't remember any, a lot of that from my lifetime. So we can really help people have some memories and create these memories for them. Um, yeah. So just being honest about death, as was mentioned, and answering any questions as best you can. We did talk about rituals and ceremonies. And please do ask either group here, hospice or seasons, reach out to us. And um, we're there on the phone. People always respond amazingly well. And you're going to get more than you asked for because I love these people at both places. They're just amazing to work with. And something really simple I like to always mention to moms and families and grandmas that eating is important, like having routines is important. Um, you know, bedtime stories are important. Helping them write and draw and scribing, I think is really very helpful for teeny ones. And let them know that they're safe and cared for and especially taking care of yourself because uh, just you're the caregiver, you're the helper, and it's 
important, even though you might be grieving too, to take very good care of yourself. It's we're, sometimes we're the first ones to go and it really shouldn't be that way. So I wanted to remind everybody today that you are a very, very important person in taking care of a grieving child. So we have to look after ourselves first. And I did la list on this last page here, um, a number of books that I love, but this is such a short list and hospice has a way better longer list and I'm sure Season Center does too. But I just wanted to put up a few that I love. Uh, the first one I already mentioned, but The Invisible Leash too, because losing a pet is important too. And the I Miss You one is a good one because it's a first look at death, like that initial death that a child experiences. And the other one I thought is important just because it's good and it's about being confused when death happens. And that often happens, like especially with little kids as was mentioned, they, they really, death's been talked about, but they don't really know that, okay, dead. Oh yeah. Is that like when I stepped on a bug and now it's dead for good? You know, that whole idea is it's gone forever. Nothing in the body is working. Um, and that grief bubble one, I just thought was good because it's an, um, a workbook kind of thing that you could have and just something that you might use as a tool. And the other one, I think we've had a few conversations at hospice numerous times about what a funeral is or what the celebration is like. And this is a very well-written story, but it just encourages some conversations about what the rituals are in their family. And maybe the next time they have that experience, it might look totally different. So it's like the world is a different place. So it could be different religions, different celebrations. Um, Cremation, death, caskets, celebrations. So all of these things children do have questions about. And if you're not sure, again, I, I ask you, just please don't be afraid to call us and ask. And again, I just want to say thank you to everybody for attending today. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, thank you to our three panelists for sharing that valuable information. We really appreciate that you're able to uh, come tonight and share that with everyone. So we do have some questions here, so I will read them out. Um, so the first one, so is there a good book to help a nine-year-old whose cat just died, having a very difficult time dealing with it? So I know you did mention the one, Victoria, but any other suggestions? Um, I can't think, for me personally, I, I know I have, we have some titles at hospice and I don't have them on the, tip of my fingers right now but there's the book um I will always love you they have a um one for pets I'm just looking it up right now because I can't think of the title off the top of my head so let me just look that up quickly right as Danielle looks that up we can go to this question so Joan this is towards you um how can we join an on our own group at season center your speaker's off, Joan. Yeah, you're muted there. Thanks, Victoria. Um, you just call the center uh, at 705-721-5437 and um, tell them that you would like to join the On Our Own group and they will direct you to either Natasha or Danielle and who will... Um, take your name and the information and then you can join. We are, our groups at the present time uh, for adults are via Zoom. Usually they're in the center, but unfortunately because of COVID they're, they're not. So we're doing virtual groups right now with the adults. Um, and just to answer the question, so I found the book. Um, it's called Until We Meet Again, From Grief to Hope After Losing a Pet. And the author is Melissa Lyons. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, another question here. So, um, so tell the truth, we get that. Any advice about wording and level of detail depending on age? Example, parent died by suicide. Do you share the specific way that they died? or die by overdose, do you share the drug that resulted in the overdose? Um, well, 
Oh, sorry, Joan. Go ahead. Wanna... Go ahead, Danielle. I'll start and then you can, uh, okay. you can okay. come in. So I think that's a really fantastic question. Um, so our policy is really to tell as much as asked. So oftentimes, let's say somebody dies by suicide. The child says, where were they shot? They may not want to know that the person was shot in the head, but they were shot in the living room. So sometimes it's asking a little bit more prompting questions. So for example, um, the child says, so they, you, you explain to the child the person died by overdose. Um, and then, you know, they may say, well, how? They may not be asking the medication that they took. They may, may be asking, you know, was it a, like, how did they do it? Like, did it, was it injected? Was it, you know? So really, again, it's based on development. So age level development. And we never give more information than what the child is asking. And oftentimes when a child asks me in my professional role and, you know, in our professional roles, Joan and uh, Victoria, I will say, do you want to know this? So it's really clarifying. Are you looking to know this? Do you want to know this? Um, there's a, a little person I've been working with and her mom died um, by overdose. And she doesn't know that because when I say, do you want to know how your mom died? She just says no. I'm not going to say, well, then I'm going to tell you. And so I've, you know, talked to her family and said, we, you know, there will come a time when perhaps she wants to know more about that. But for now, we just leave it. Do you have something to add to that, Joan? Um, not really. I mean, but you, I know at the center, we use the word somebody died by suicide. And then, and again, we only answer questions if they ask another one, right? Eventually, they will want to know, right? And we would use the word suicide just like somebody died from cancer or somebody died from a heart attack. They may not understand that. They might may understand they have a heart, but depending on the age of the child. So you only give them the information that they ask for. Um, and as they get older, part of it, the questions are more curiosity. Uh, I don't know some of the things, but yeah, it's the same answer that you gave, Danielle. <laughs> okay. okay, a comment here. So I want to express my gratitude to all the panelists and everyone involved in coordinating tonight's session. What an important and complex topic it is, and it's wonderful to hear so many great insights. I know Seasons has many online resources which can help for parents or anyone who struggle with knowing where to start. Another helpful resource hub that I came across recently is Dr. J's Children Grief Center website. Great. So, and this person had left that website. So it's just um, HTTP, um, it's Dr. J Children's Grief Center .ca slash program slash, slash resources. And I will copy that and put it into the chat window in case anyone is wanting that as well. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And another question. So what are the signs that indicate that a teen expressing his or her grief by unhealthy behavior is in trouble and should be referred to professional help? Go ahead, Victoria. Well, I would, not knowing the teen or the age, but I think just ab unusual behaviors that are not the norm for that person. And I think of, um, I think of teenagers especially might be, you know, might isolate, start might isolating themselves or um, their temper changes or eating habits change. They're not seeing their friends. Um, and I, and especially when you see the emotional changes, I think if they're not coping well, you're going to know that they're not talking to you or communicating with you very well, and you're not feeling connected. So I think that's the time when you realize that you're, you yourself are at a loss for figuring out what the challenge is. And I always like to recommend that someone um, ask a teen, but realizing that you're not in a position to be helping them much right now. And are, are you, would you like to go talk to somebody about this? Like a third party person, which teens will respond to. Um, they may not want to go at first by themselves, but if you're seeing the signs that you think, oh, something, this is, they're really off. I would suggest that you might go with them first, the first time, and then maybe they will enter into a conversation with someone after you might even go as a, a couple or you know two people because 
that might be your entry point and then you can back out. So those would be a couple suggestions I might have, but I please somebody else, please uh, add comments too. Danielle, you've worked with teens a lot too, and I'm sure yeah. you have too, Joan. No, I think what you said was great, Victoria. I think the, the big thing with teens to just be aware of is the potential of suicidal ideations. Um, I'm not saying that this happens every single time, of course, um, but it's worth asking and making sure, you know, um, in, and again, you know, seeking help to do that. You don't necessarily have to be the one to do that, but if they're not willing or if they're not wanting to go, like what Victoria said, asking a very direct and clear question if you are really concerned. If there's lots of red flags, they're isolating, uh, not seeing friends, really disengaged, um, you know, little affect, you know, those sorts of things. You can say, are you thinking about suicide or hurting yourself? Asking a really direct question like that. Um, and then you can take further um, steps from there. And kids, and that doesn't, just to clarify, that doesn't give kids the, or teens the idea. It just really is clarifying for you and really mm -hmm. your next steps from there. Um, I've asked that question a lot. It gets easier um, as you ask. So you can practice in the mirror, practice mm -hmm. on a friend, um, because it's very uncomfortable to say the first few times. But I've, when I ask teens now, they are so brutally honest with me. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, I think about it all the time. I have a plan. Here's my plan. That, that's usually the response or it's, oh my gosh, no, I would never. That's crazy. Oh my gosh, no. So those are usually the two responses. It's one or the other. Sometimes they'll, they'll be like, oh, no, no, not really. Or, you know, it's kind of a vague response, but usually it's one extreme or the other. So just and something. Thank you. thank you for mentioning that too, Danielle, about the plan part, because that is very critical. And the other mm. thing that I'd like to add to that is if they actually say they have a plan, um, in the work that I do with people, it's always like, okay, if you have a plan, I, I need to know the name of a person that you promise me you will call if you decide to do that. Like, it sounds like a horrible thing to have to ask somebody, but it's almost like you want them to make a promise with you that if you are seriously going to do that, could you please promise me that you'll call someone? And, and it's not saying they will, but it also helps them to know that you really, really care, you really, really don't want this to mm. happen, and you want to know that they will s at least tell somebody. So it's tough, as Danielle mentioned. And I think yeah. going back to the question too, I, I think partially the reason I brought that up was because that can be a huge indicator, right? Even when um, teens or really anybody is just idolizing it, so they're thinking about it, they're toying with the idea, I'd like to die, that's a really clear cut sign that um, support mm -hmm. is needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you can also give them uh, a, a list of uh, phone numbers that they can call. Uh, or, uh, or suggest that they go to the hospital for a, an assessment or calling somebody, um, especially children or teens. There's some, uh, um, I think there's one out of Canark um, in New Path. Um, so there are different children's services that um, would see kids um, uh, real fast. And there's some texting services now, which is fantastic. Um, kids Help Phone, which used to be, when I was in high school, it was like 25 cents to call Kids Help Phone, and you could do that. Um, but now you can text it for free anytime. 25 cents. 25 cents. I know. At the pay phone at my school, my high school. You put in 25 cents, and they had the little number there. You could call Kids Help Phone. I mean, your whole high school would hear the conversation. But um, <laughs> this way, they can, you know, teens, as we know, are um, don't always love to phone talk. They haven't been forced to talk on the phone, just given yeah. the change of the world. Totally okay. So they can actually text the number. So there's a few um, different resources. Um, usually when I ask teens um, who are kind of idolizing and they're kind of just toying with the idea, when I ask them, would you call this number or would you text this number? They have never said no. They always say yes. So far. So far in my career, they've said yes. Um, usually they, they want that support. They want help. So. Perfect. Thank you. All right. The next question. Any tips for potty training regression in a four-year-old with grief? 
<laughs> wow. That's tough. Uh, yeah. Very typical. Um, it's, it's very common. Uh, we see that um, happening. Victoria, we've had a few little people we've worked with together and it's like, oh my goodness, they don't want to drink out of a cup anymore. They want to drink out of a bottle. Like, you know, those sorts of things. The, um, the support that I usually give to people that are, are struggling with that is just consistency. It's like reteaching, lots of love, consistency, um, but we do see that quite often. Yeah. Um, routine. <laughs> and lots of love. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, what is an honest age appropriate answer to a five-year-old's question, where did grandma go? We don't even know the answer ourselves. So you're talking, the oh. question just to clarify is where did grandma go spiritually or physically? Um, sometimes when kids are asking, I think we look for the, uh, I remember when I, I took some training at University of Toronto, the Sick Kids Mental Health Institute. Um, I never even thought about this because I hear this all the time. And the, the teacher, Andrea Warnick, had said, actually, most times kids are just wondering where the body went. And that's kind of yeah. what they're asking. Maybe it's in the Q&A here. Maybe the yeah, person. So, so she just added, I think they're wondering physically. So physically, where did grandma go? Yeah. So again, we usually think essentially like, you know, as you adults, we're like, oh, wow, um, heaven. I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, so physically that um, can be answered quite clearly and honestly. Um, again, honesty is the best policy, as Joan and Victoria have um, talked about as well. Um, I think first, before um, that question is answered, um, that the five-year-old, because five is pretty young, um, but they understand that the body, the, the body doesn't feel anything. So, um, because before you start going into burial, cremation, those sorts of things, that can seem really scary if the body still has autonomy. So if the body's still potentially feeling something, oh my gosh, like that's very scary. So first, before you're answering that question, where has she gone? To just remind the child that the body doesn't feel anything. Um, that when a body is dead, you know, it's not breathing, it's not, the heart is not beating, they cannot see, smell, touch, hear, taste, play, sing, yeah. dance, any of that. Um, and then you can answer with, um, so when somebody dies, so when their body dies, um, perhaps the body is in the ground now at a cemetery over by the playground or whatever you want to explain that with. There's a really great book um, called When Dinosaurs Die that has a little um, definitions in the back of all those things like cemetery, cremation, and has a kind of a kid-friendly um, explanation. That's another really good resource. And I also think that depending on what your spiritual beliefs, comforts, religions are, you can have a meaningful conversation about the physical body isn't here, but you can, you know, say it's the memory necklace. You, you can be with grandma's spirit by just um, yeah. remembering those times with her. Those memories keep her alive. And I don't mean, it's not the same, but, you know, Santa Claus is like <laughs> this person, magical person. And they, little kids still do believe in these, a spiritual realm in a sense that they, they can handle that. So, but it depends on what religion you're from. So yeah, if you're comfortable talking about that from your own religious stance, that's one way. But if you want to talk about spirit, you know, grandma's spirits everywhere, if that's something you think your five-year-old could handle um, and you can visit her by the invisible string or whatever it is. Um, I think it's more about the comfort level of the adult talking about it sometimes than it is the child mm -hmm. and what your family mm -hmm. is willing to continue the conversation as. Mm -hmm. Because if it's, if you say something, um, asking yourself, am I prepared to continue having this kind of a conversation with this five-year-old? Otherwise, I think like Danielle says, and Joan too, it's better to keep it simple and honest and find out what they're really asking. Because they just might want to know if she's dead like a bug. 
Yeah. And then and I, now she's I, gone. I know uh, in when the, that question comes up in our groups um, that we actually ask the question back so we can verify what they're actually asking. Um, because we we can talk about religion or we can talk about spirituality, but there be different people in the group with different beliefs. So we always have to talk about, you know, there is no, no right or wrong. It's what you believe mm -hmm. that we um, that we share with the group. Yeah. And my uh, my favorite resource to share with parents and uh, guardians and people who love children is the be right back jar or the next morning jar or whatever you want to call it, because those big, big, big questions often come three minutes after they were supposed to be sleeping or at a really <laughs> uncomfortable, weird time that's hard to answer. And if you're becoming emotional or don't have the answer, because sometimes I even get hit with questions that I'm like, I did not expect this child in this moment to ask me that. And so instead of just saying, I don't know, or, you know, kind of dismissing it, which is so easy and I'm guilty guilty over here. I've done that before. I just say, you know, we have a jar at hospice. That's like the be right back jar, or, you know, we're going to come back to this question. So I very intentionally write the question down. And then that also gives the adult some time to think about the question and maybe come up with a solution or, you know, an answer or to reach out. I always say to families when they're doing an intake with me, use that jar email me and come back to it the next day. I said, we can talk it out. Um, you know, use those online resources. So if they're asking a really tough question, like what happened to, to grandma's body when it was cremated? If it's 8.30 at night and kiddo was supposed to be sleeping 15 minutes ago, that's a big question. So, you know, you can yeah. say, we're going to come back to that because that's a really good question. So let's talk about it tomorrow or whenever and just come back to it. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and there's one more and it's a comment. It just says, thank you for an amazing evening of a difficult topic. Great resources and information. And I just wanted to share that. So I'll, um, so that was the last question. So I uh, thank you all for asking. Um, I'm going to, before we end, I'm just going to do one additional poll here, which is just going to ask you a couple questions in regards to evaluation. So please take a couple minutes to fill that out. You'll see it pop up on your screen. Perfect. All right, I'm just going to end that. Wonderful. Uh, so thank you again to the three panelists to share all that valuable information and for each of you for attending tonight. Um, if you're wanting more information or you're looking for, for some support, and it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, six sessions with one of our, our people, it can be anything from assisting with wording, education, resources. If you're looking for that type of information, please reach out to us. Um, to either season center or hospice. Um, in addition to that, if you're wanting the video, because we are recording, or the PowerPoint, or again, a list of resources, um, please reach out to our office administrator. I will put her contact information in our chat window as well, um, and we can provide you with that as well. So, oh, I think we might have one. Oh, no, it's gone. All right, so thank you again for, for attending tonight. And again, any questions or comments that you think of after, we can put in the Be Right Back jar and you, you can ask us uh, <laughs> tomorrow or, or later this week or next. All right, thank you everyone. And I will put Doris's information in the chat box. Perfect. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.